Welcome back to the Farm Side Chat. This is Zippy Duval. I'm president of American Farm Bureau and a farmer in Georgia. As we travel across the country, I stop and talk to farmers and I love hearing their stories. And today we're gonna stop down in Southern Texas and talk about a great commodity that's grown all across the Southern part of our country. And that is cotton. The cotton that's used to make our t-shirts and our blue jeans and so many things that we take advantage of each and every day. Our guest today is uh, Colin Choplis. He is uh, from Choplis Farm, uh, just north of Corpus Christi, Texas. Good morning, President Duvall. Thanks, thanks for having me and, and putting this together and looking forward to a conversation today. And my name is Colin Choplis and I'm a fifth generation farmer from the southern part of Texas, down here, what we call the, the coastal bend. So we're uh, located just north of Corpus Christi, Texas. And that's um, about two hours from the Rio Grande Valley and the Mexico border, and about two hours uh, south of, of San Antonio. So I think it's kind of kin to okra or some other plant. What, what, would, you, what would you say is kin to? Well, you know, cotton is a, is a very, um, it's very different from a lot of the other commodities that that uh, farmers are used to growing and you know we certainly enjoy growing it on our farm but it certainly has a lot of challenges associated with it also you know we we also grow corn and grain sorghum which are more traditional of a grass crop and probably something that most listeners are, are familiar with but the yeah, cotton is definitely a, a different animal altogether um, it, it kind of grows similar to a, to a soybean um, but quite a bit different as well so so we, we start planting cotton down here in, in late February, early March, which, you know, we're in the southern part of Texas and Texas is a very large state, as y'all know. So in the northern part of the state, they haven't even began or just now starting to plant cotton. And, and we already have cotton that's been in the ground for a couple of months now. So it's a very diverse growing region across the state of Texas and across the United States, of course. But uh, so we, we plant a little early down here. Um, for various reasons, you know, one just being we're a warmer climate, uh, we we get our soil temperatures up a lot faster. Uh, usually, we'll be in the 60 degree range of our soil temperatures pretty early on in the year, and that's that's good time to go ahead and start putting some cotton seed in the ground. And uh, you know, assuming we have a little moisture to work with, and things are off and running down here. Compared to the other commodities you grow, corn and others, is it the first crop that you put in the ground, or second or third? Or no, sir. So cotton is actually the, the last crop we'll plant. Uh, we usually start with corn around Valentine's Day, and then we'll transition into grain sorghum after that, and then we'll finish up with, with cotton. And, you know, just depending on kind of how the planting year goes, you know, cotton may be right there around the 1st of March going in the ground, but a lot of times it, it's later towards the end of end of March. And uh, that, that can tend to be, be better in the long run, you know, the day length is a little bit longer, the soil's a little long, a little warmer, and so things tend to grow a little faster later in the year. But, you know, one of the unique things about this region of, of Texas and something we always have to be concerned about is we're located just a matter of miles from the Gulf of Mexico. And so there's always that threat in August and September of having any kind of tropical weather you know people always think of hurricanes and stuff but really just getting a, a tropical wave or a depression come in here and we can get you know 10 to 15 inches of rain and literally ruin a cotton crop right before harvest and that that can certainly be you know, very hard to, to fathom having something like that happen but it does happen from time to time so we try to get in a little earlier so was it harvey that came in several several years ago that did so much destruction Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We yeah. 2017 had Hurricane Harvey went in uh, about 35 miles from where I'm sitting right now. And uh, we were very fortunate to have all of our cotton harvested in round modules or round bales, which we now put put cotton in and at the cotton gin. Um, a lot of producers just a little bit further up the coast as you get closer to Houston still had a lot of that cotton in the field. And unfortunately, the majority of that was completely ruined and, and was lost. Yeah, that was devastating. I was I had been elected about a year as, as American Farm Bureau president. I came down and visited that area and I, I could not believe what I saw when I came down there. I mean, some of the round bells had floated into the wood. Yes. I mean, uh, the 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 uh the stacks, what do you call it? The uh square stacks. 
Oh, the, the uh, conventional modules that look like yeah, a the modules. Of bread. I saw, I saw, they had blown them off. They were about a foot high instead of six foot tall, and it it was devastating. I had never seen. It looked like a bomb had went off in that. Yes, place. that's the best way to describe it. It looks like a bomb went off. It was absolutely yeah. incredible. And I mean, there was cotton in the trees hanging on the side of buildings, and it was amazing how that wind just yes. tore it off. And we had a fantastic crop that year, one of the best best cotton yields we'd had in a very long time. And that went all the way up the coast. And those farmers were so unfortunate to lose nearly all of their crop that year. It was it was really devastating. Right. So uh, let's talk about that. You talked a little bit. Of, you've already planted and where it's at now and, and, and the risk of harvesting it during hurricane season. Talk about the rest of the lifespan of the cotton plant and, and what are you having to do it along? This, this show will, will run about the end of July. What do you think you'll be doing the end of July? Sure. So we, you know, the, we always say one of the hardest challenges of growing cotton is just to get it out of the ground the first time. And so once we get the plant up and established, you know, it's really just a matter of, of mother nature and, and us taking care of the plant to, to get us along. So, you know, of course, having ample rainfall at, at the right time is extremely important. Uh, we have very little irrigation in this region of Texas. Uh, that's quite a bit different from western parts of Texas where they rely heavily on irrigation. But uh, typically we get around 30 inches of rainfall a year. And so that's sufficient to grow cotton. And one reason we grow cotton is it doesn't take as much water as other things like, like corn do. So, so we'll, we'll continue to manage pests. Pests are our biggest issue. Again, we're in a very warm climate. So everything grows and everything wants to eat our, our crop down here. So we, we spend a lot of time managing uh, pest issues. And of course, you know, spraying insecticides and fungicides are extremely expensive and something that we only do when it's absolutely necessary to apply those, those kind of products. And so, you know, we try to do the best we can to take care of our crop. And as it grows and progresses, we get towards the July and August timeframe and the plant begins to naturally shut down and those bowls that have been formed open and that's where we see the white fluffy cotton inside those bowls and when it gets to a, a completed point we apply a product on there that that causes the leaves to fall off uh, it doesn't kill the plant but it, it does take all the leaves off the plant so that we can harvest it easier and that we get less what we call trash or that leaf material in our cotton sample, right? Everybody wants to have that bright white fluffy cotton. And so that's that's how that process kind of works. And, um, you know, hopefully again, we don't get any bad weather once that cotton is exposed and completely open to the elements and we have a successful harvest. Cotton, we all know cotton use, a lot of t-shirts, a lot of blue jeans. Tell us some other products that it might be used in. Sure, so, you know, cotton is such a unique crop and a unique product, right? I mean, first of all, the, the plant's goal is to grow seed to reproduce. And the lint fiber, the white lint that we're most common with, is actually grown as a byproduct to protect that seed. So, you know, we're using the cotton lint and that goes into so many different things. I mean, I, I promise you, every one of your listeners today have already interacted with American cotton, whether that be the bed sheets that you slept on, the clothes you put on this morning, the money that's in your wallet has a, a large percentage of, of cotton in it. Um, so many different things in the medical field that uses utilizes the cotton fiber. Um, my wife and I are expecting our, our first baby in September and lots of cotton. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> lots of cotton that goes into, into those products such as diapers and baby wipes. And that's something my wife's been very vigilant of is, you know, we want to have the you know, the, the best thing for the baby and that's American cotton, right? So that's right. we're looking, looking forward to that. But, uh, you know, and another big use is that cotton seed, right? So the, the, the seed doesn't go to waste at all. Uh, some of it's going to be retained and, and used again next year to, to plant again. Um, a large amount of it will go into animal feed. It's a very good source of protein and something kind of unique that, that we use it for down here is uh, a lot of our, large um, deer, white-tailed deer operations um, will feed cotton seed as a supplement. So, you know, the traditional corn feeder on a, on a deer ranch has kind of changed a little bit. Now it's got a, a feeder feeding cotton seed right next to it also. 
So as a feed product, I mean, I, I spent 30 years dairying here in Georgia, and we 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 fed somewhere between three to five pounds of cotton to every cow every day, and, and because it has a scratchy factor to it in the rumen that uh, causes more butterfat in the milk, which we got paid for more butterfat. So right, uh, it was right. it was a it's a great product for dairy animals. Yes, sir. Absolutely, that's that's awesome. You know, there's no telling how much cotton seed. I, I have fed through my dairy over those 30 years. So the, talk a little bit about that lint. And I see that you go through a process of de -lining. Tell Tell us a little bit about that. Some of this cotton will be retained. The seed will be retained to, to replant next year. Years and years ago, they used to plant what they called fuzzy cotton seed. So they would literally plant the, the seed as it came out of the cotton gin with that real fine lint left on it. Well, nowadays they run it through an additional process called delinting, where they remove that really fine seed and it, it leaves just that, that clear seed coat left over. And that, you know, the real reason they do that is because our modern day planters require that smoother seed, you know, such as a, a corn seed or, or a wheat seed, if you're familiar with, with what that looks like, it's a smooth coating. So the same process with cotton, by removing that fine lint, we get down to that bare seed coat and that's what we'll use again to, to plant cotton with next year. And of course, that, that fiber that's removed can be used in, in different products as well. You know, it, it doesn't go to waste either. Yeah. So talk a little bit more about that cotton seed. There's been a lot of work done on the technologies around cotton seed. Uh, tell us the benefit of that uh, from the aspect of growing it, uh, protecting our natural resources, how much you have to plow. Tell us how that that technology in that seed helped you on your farm? You know, absolutely. Technology in cotton has advanced so much in, in the last 20 years, really. I mean, when, when I began farming again with my family, we were growing uh, what we called brown bag cotton, which was seed that we retained on our farm personally. And because there was no technology in it, uh, it was just, you know, gin run seed and, and we would replant that seed. We did that for a long, long time. And uh, as the technology got better and better and these varieties got so much better in the breeding process. You know, now they can select for longer staple length and lower micronary and higher yielding potential and combine that with some of the BT qualities where we're protecting against, you know, different pests that we don't have to spray insecticide because the plant naturally defends itself against those insects. Um, you know, two big issues we we've, we've always had here was was uh, the bowl worm, right? So we get those bowls, and before they open, that worm will start chewing on it, and it'll ruin the bowl, and it'll never produce. But now with the technology we have, the, the plant's able to defend itself, and so we don't have as much issue or, or very little issue at all with with bowl worm anymore. And uh, one other big thing that that's really revolutionized the, the cotton industry, especially in South Texas, was what we refer to as the eradication of the boll weevil. And uh, for years and years, uh, the boll weevil would literally take 20 to 30% of your yield just straight off the top. And uh, that, that insect would get in there and it would pierce that bowl and it would ruin it. It would never produce anything. And through a combination of both the farmers, the state and federal money, uh, we went through a process about 10 to 20 years long of effectively eradicating the boll weevil. And uh, made a huge difference in, in where we are today in the cotton industry. If you had the choice to go back and plant that old seed or keep using the, this new seed with technology, is there even a thought to go back to it? <laughs> no, sir, there sure isn't. You know, it, the ability of these plants now to, you know, overcome drought and overcome pest and overcome, you know, so many environmental changes, you know, it, it's really truly amazing what technology's done to American farmers. You know, we, we do such a better job now with being able to plant seed, place it in, in the exact location it needs to be using precision planting technology. We're able to variable rate our fertilizer, you know, where we put just enough that we need to, to get that crop going. And, you know, we've made some huge strides and, you know, it's going to be exciting to see what the next 10 to 20 years bring. You know, I can, I can only imagine what, what our son's going to see in, in the, the sixth generation of this farm, hopefully. Yeah. So you're, what you're saying is your farm uh, environmental and sustainability uh, areas is a lot more healthier with this new variety of seed that has uh, technology in it that helps you do a better job of protecting those natural resources. 
you know, American cotton farmers have reduced their amount of insecticide and chemicals that they spray by over 50% in the last 20 years. I think that's a huge testament to the stewardship practices of farmers. You know, again, those chemicals are extremely expensive and we certainly don't want to have to use them unless it's absolutely necessary. But, you know, this technology just continues to advance and advance. And we're able now to, to precisely identify the type of insect that we want to target and we can kill just that one and leave our good beneficials out there because they're continuing to work for us. And thankfully, uh, they, they don't cost anything to work. So we appreciate them. So a lot of times we as farmers get a bad rap for using these new technologies. And really and truly what the general public doesn't know is those technologies help us to protect our climate and our natural resources on our land and help us be more efficient and be able to stay on our farm, be more sustainable economically and uh, 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 environmentally. Uh, so I try to tell people every day, you know, uh, sustainability is a buzzword right now uh, and everybody wants to talk about it, but we've been talking about it for decades in agriculture and it just comes natural to us. Uh, so we're kind of, we're, we're kind of excited about having the opportunity to talk about what we've been doing for decades because a lot of times people have given us a bad rap when they didn't really know what we were doing to protect our environment. I think it's important when, when looking at that word sustainability to talk about the economic sustainability. You know, it, it's hard to have a multi-generational farm if the best you've done is break even every year, right? And I, I don't think it's a bad thing to, to say that, you know, being economically viable year in and year out, which involves having a profit from time to time, you know, is, is certainly part of our sustainability story, you know, and in order to have it for the next generation, you know, we've got to have farmers continue to produce and continue continue to produce in a profitable manner. We talk a lot about the average age of the farmer being 65. And, you know, I'm over 65 now. We need more people to look like your age and even younger coming to our industry. And we have to make sure that our our agriculture is financially sustainable, uh, economically sustainable, so that we can draw uh, more young people to the industry. because. You know, now they get a good education. They can come out and make pretty good money. And, and that's not guaranteed to you on the farm, that's for sure. So, so we talk in and about and around the challenges in agriculture and growing cotton. Tell, tell me what you think the biggest challenges you face on your farm. Sure. You know, there, there's a lot of them, right? So the, uh, obviously, cost of production, particularly in these last couple of years, has just skyrocketed. You know, everything is so much more expensive. And I know all the American consumers are facing the same thing. I mean, I go to the grocery store every weekend and I, I know how expensive everything is. And it's the same on the farm. You know, we're spending so much more money for seed, for chemical, for fertilizer, uh, just, you know, basic day to day operations, the cost of running equipment and fuel. And, you know, the, the price of new equipment is just astronomical. And so that it takes such so much more management skills to be able to, to manage this because, you know, our profit margins really haven't changed. It's still just a very small, small little strip in there. It's just the whole thing has moved up so much higher, you know, and, and our, you know, our risk factor is just so much greater. You know, that's why, you know, things such as the farm bill and the, the safety net programs are, are so important, you know, and, and People, I guess sometimes we don't realize you know, why those are, are necessary, but you know, we don't want to go to a store to buy some t-shirts or some blue jeans and have that price be $40 one week and be $400 the next week. And that's why those programs to keep American farmers producing and keep a sustainable, steady food supply, uh, fuel, fiber, and food is so important. So you mentioned Farm Bill and that was where I was going next. So it's a great lead into it. Uh we're working real hard in, in Washington, D.C. to make sure this next farm bill gets done on time one, but also protects those risk management tools that you value so much on like your farm and everybody else does across America. Tell us what the farm bill actually does for you on your farm. How has it helped you in the past and why does it need to continue to be supported? Because we're out there right now promoting that we look at the target prices that are set in Title I program because of that cost of production you just referenced, and also the importance of protecting the investment that the federal government puts into crop insurance and how it protects us. So tell us how you may have 
has, has helped your farmer be sustained. Yes, sir. So, you know, farm bill, extremely important to, to all farmers and particularly farmers here in South Texas, where our weather is so, you know, we have so much variability in, in our weather. Um, you know, the Title I programs and, and the current reference prices with this high inflationary period we're in right now just simply don't work on our operation. You know, they're just not going to trigger at those low levels. And and so looking at reference price increases is something that, you know, it's, it's got to be done. And I understand, you know, budgetary restrictions are what they are, right? And, you know, it, it's going to be hard to do anything without more money on, on the baseline. And that's something I think's really got to be addressed. You know, we've We've had over the last five years, like $93 billion in ad hoc money put into the farm bill. And, you know, I think if we could have some of that as a truly bankable program, uh, would go a long ways to helping our operation. And, and what I mean by bankable is myself and, and most farmers, we borrow money to operate on and, and to be able to go to the, the bank and say, okay, if, if everything goes completely downhill, what are we going to have to support us? And, you know, currently, that title one is not a bankable program and uh but the saving grace is crop insurance and it always has been right so we we've been very fortunate to to rely on crop insurance on years we certainly hope we don't have to have it but on some of these years like we talked about where you have disasters that you know whether it be drought or excessive rainfall and sometimes we get both of those in the same year down here and uh to have the ability to, to rely on a program like crop insurance which is you know, not just a, a government subsidized program, but it's something that the farmer pays into to participate in. And, and again, having um, big swings in the weather in this region of Texas makes uh, our crop insurance premiums very high. But, you know, at the end of the day, we, we can't farm without that. And so it's it's extremely important risk management tool on our farm. So I can just imagine that uh, our non-farmer listeners are sitting out there saying, well, why should we have risk management tools that the general public help uh, support for farmers and not for other small businesses. And I'll, I'm going to make a comment and you just add into it how you want to, uh, uh, Colin. Uh, you, we, we look and we all should look at uh, food uh, production and shelter production and clothing production as a national security issue. Uh, our, our country is free because we are able to feed and clothe and house ourselves here because of the great production level of American agriculture. And it needs to be sustainable. And with these big swings in weather, big swings in market, uh, there's no guarantee that the bank will loan you the money to plant that next crop. So to secure our country, uh, have national security, our food system has to be, uh, have some risk management tools built in there. And that benefits every American it keeps food cheaper at the grocery store, uh, and none of us could afford to go to the grocery store if we were at, at the whims of the weather without having risk management food. So the Farm Bill is called Farm Bill, but really and truly, my opinion and our organization's opinion is I'll be called a food and Farm Bill because over 80% of the spending in the Farm Bill goes to nutrition programs. Now, we support nutrition programs because we know that there's people in our country that not as uh, fortunate as others and need a hand up uh, and through uh, feeding their families. And so we, we totally support that. Uh, uh, it is a safety net for the people that's not as fortunate as in, in America, just like the safety net there for farmers to make sure that we can continue to fill America's pantry. Uh, so the farm and food bill is an, the, probably one of the most important pieces of legislation that goes through Washington. And we, we would hope that not just farmers, but every American would encourage their congressmen and senators to get this done and get it done on time so that we keep our country secure and our food system plentiful and, and, it, and at a reasonable price for everyone to be able to purchase it. Uh, Colin, we've had a great conversation about a wonderful product that's not only grown in Texas, but has, is a big crop here in Georgia. Uh, and I see a lot of wonderful families putting their heart, heart and soul into growing it uh, all across the southeastern and southern part of our country. We appreciate what you do. And I'd ask you if there's anything else you'd like to add to our conversation today before we sign off. I uh, certainly enjoyed the conversation. I just encourage all your listeners to, to go out and, and buy American cotton. 
you know, check those those labels on your products at the store and ensure that they they come with a, a naturally grown sustainable fiber like like cotton. You know, let's let's try to to stay away from a lot of those synthetics and polyesters and things that you know cause pollution to the environment. And let's support uh, American grown natural cotton. The other thing is, uh, you are you social media active, and if they want to know more about you and your farm, where do they find you? No, I'm I'm not a big social media person. I, I got a little bit on on Twitter, but uh, I I try to try to shy away from that a little bit. Most farmers are too busy to think about what they're going to post on social media. That's exactly. We're, we're but that, I, my my staff is all the time says, "Well, when you own the farm, take a picture and put it on social media." Well, I'm I'm busy thinking about what I got to do to take care of the land and the animals and and how I'm going to do it efficiently. And make sure we don't get hurt doing it. So, and I'm sure you're the same way. I uh, same way. I sure appreciate those out there that do do it. I think you do a good job of telling our stories. Yeah, we we need them to keep doing it. That's for sure. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Colin, thank you so much for joining me today and letting our listeners learn a little bit more about your state, your farm, and that great commodity that you grow, uh, great American cotton. So, thank you. We hope that everyone will have a wonderful day, and we uh, we both say God bless. You. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Farmside Chat. Please be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And while you're at it, take a minute to rate and review the podcast. This helps us continue to bring you farm fresh content that everyone can enjoy. Until next time, thank you and God bless you.